Hi, Render ATL. Is this is my mic on? Is it working? Excellent. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you for sticking it out to the end. Um, and it has been a great first day, yes? Fantastic. Um, as mentioned, my name is Tejas. That's pronounced like contagious. Um, and for those of you who think it's Tejas, it's not. Um, and you know, I have to say, uh, this conference, I speak at a lot of conferences, um, up to 32 this year so far. Um, and this is the first conference where I've just felt really, not just OK, but I felt like good and proud about being black. You know, it's just absolutely phenomenal. So a round of applause for the Render ATL. <laughs> phenomenal. Um, so good. So good. Um, I run a very small but effective developer relations consultancy. Um, and what that means is we just like help a lot of developer-oriented companies do DevRel in one way or another through small projects, through large, whatever. And it's just an honor and a privilege, a privilege and a great joy to be able to have such impact. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Today we're here to talk about React as a developer help tool. Um, mainly because if you've been around Twitter for a while, um, you may have seen you know, people talk smack about React. I had to self-censor there. I wanted to use the other S word. Um, but people saying things about use effect, um, oh, use memo, I don't, I don't know when to use it. Um, signals are way better than everything else. Um, and why is React not, you know, server components, what even is that? So on and so forth. And, and I, I hear that, and you know, many of those criticisms are valid, but um, th there's no question. React still is the leader of the, at least in terms of adoption and job market of the industry. Um, and I, I want to speak a little bit to its original intentions and how it may have veered from its intentions, from its course, um, and the work that's being done to kind of reconcile it back to its original mission, okay? And with that, I want to, I want to kind of make the point about React's intent. Because if you think back to 2014, when I started working with React, um, things were different back then, right? There, there were tools like Knockout, maybe, that, that were prevalent. Um, but UI updates were difficult. They were a hard problem, especially at the scale um, that Facebook and other large companies, Netflix, for example, would experience. And certainly some of the clients that I used to service back when I had a small, um, back when I worked at rather a small consultancy. I started in a consultancy. I have a consultancy now. It's just full circle, um, kind of like server rendering. But anyway, um, <laughs> React, the intention was make updates efficient and safe and testable through time and space and company size. And indeed, that's the case. Um, another way of expressing this is the methodology of write once, deploy anywhere. So through things like JSX and the declarative stateful hooks, use state, et cetera, you can write React like in JSX, and this will, this you can transfer your applications between platforms like the web, like native, like even the CLI with things like React Inc, right? It's, it's this beautiful declarative way of writing things once and deploying everywhere, all in service of what? In service of developer health through declarative abstraction, right? We're no longer doing document.createElement.appendChild.querySelector, et cetera. Not that those are bad, but at scale, they're easy to get wrong unless we are very meticulous, but then that costs time, and then you don't ship fast enough, and then your PMs are like, what's wrong with you? We're paying you a huge amount of money. Why are you not shipping things? And that's a whole other can of worms, right? So React in intent is to provide this declarative safe layer that will allow us to ship things fast. I'd like to, just to make this a little bit more concrete, write a little bit of imperative pre-React code to, just, to, get a, to get us all on the same page of what React is saving us from. This is a contrived, silly example Consider it a warm-up exercise, because I'm super nervous, and this uh, makes me less nervous or something, something like that. Anyway, um, we have a blank page and a text editor. And what I want to do is make a counter and hope that GitHub Copilot doesn't spoil it. So we'll do a standard HTML document. And if this was a React app, we'd do something like div id root. Um, and we'd have a script tag, all right? And what do we want to do? Well, <laughs> oh, what was that? Hello, Copilot. How are you doing? Um, what is this? This is definitely not what we want to do, um, although, thank you. We do want the root element, so we'll keep that, right? And what we want to do is have maybe a heading, so we'll do const heading, and this is document.create, okay, cool. And we want its text content to not be hello world, but let's have it be my counter. We'll do a span as well. What? <laughs> uh, I wish the VS Code people were watching this. We'll do a span, um, and the span's text content will also be um, no. Uh, let's do count is, um, and then we'll do plus, I don't know, count, right? Count is not defined, and this is not TypeScript, so 
cool, I guess, but we'll let count equal zero. Um, and lastly, we need a button. So we'll say, yeah, wow, not bad. All right, we'll do increment button. Um, sure. And then, come on, give me an event handler. Ooh, fantastic. Rizelle is speaking about Copilot. Um, go to that talk. <laughs> so this looks good. Um, let's save it and see what we have. And indeed, we have nothing because I haven't started Vite, or have I? NPX Vite, maybe? OK, 5174, cool. That's 5177. Um, hello? Maybe let me kill a bunch of things that I have running here and hope that it works. What? But it was, am I? Ah, sorry, I'm in the wrong directory, NPX Vite. All right, let's go here. All right. And we have nothing because I haven't appended children. And this is exactly the thing that React saves us from, mind you. So we'll do document dot, actually it's a root element, dot append child, and we will let Copilot finish the rest. Um, we actually don't want to do this. We want to do heading, span, and increment button. So we append some elements, and we have this, although not quite, because once again, there's problems. Um, what are the problems? Maybe we do it like this. And you know, I'm trying to make the point that this stuff was hard before React appeared. Anyway, so it exists now. We have a counter. Is it going to work? Let's see. OK, it does. But let's take a moment and appreciate the magnificent hack that we've created here, all in service of getting a counter working. And it's not even a pretty counter at that, right? But we are imperatively creating elements. Um, we are attaching things. And I don't, I don't know if we're doing this all that well. Um, one thing that we're doing here, get element by ID, is actually pretty nice because it's faster than this, right? And if we don't work with React or Vue or Angular or Svelte, we need to keep things like this in mind. We need to use up cognitive resources. That query element, sorry, query selector, excuse me, is slower than get element by ID because it needs to do a full page scan, et cetera. So React and other UI libraries show up and save us from this. In fact, if we contrast this with React code, um, let's just take a quick look. I mean, the difference is night and day, right? Um, in service of developer health, I mean, I just literally say I want to H1, a P, a button, on click, I want to do this and it just works. This is the original reason for React, and I would say I'm still just as in awe with React as I was in 2014 because of that. Every single day, I build more and more ambitious applications, as I'm sure many of you do, because of this thing, because it's a declarative, beautiful abstraction, and it has been a service to my developer health, as I'm sure it has been for you. Now, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about how React sucks. <laughs> um, this, this is what people have been complaining about on Twitter. And I want to address these points and then you know, allude to some of the work that's being done to help remedy this and kind of bring React back to um, where it, it should be or where it wants to be. Um, at this point, I feel it fitting to say I don't work on React. I'm not part, I'm not part of the code core team. I'm not an author. I, I am a user. And sometimes we'll talk to people in my DevRel roles, but I, I author nothing. And then there's people who are way more qualified than I am. I just happen to talk about it a lot. Okay? Um, anyone use Apple products? Do you use iPhones in here? Any iPhone users? OK, that's almost everybody. Keep your hand up. Um, and I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to ask a second question, but keep your hand up. Anyone use a MacBook or an Apple computer? OK, yeah, that's almost the entire room, except like three dudes over there. Thank you. Thank you for this exercise. Um, all of us, most of us, majority of us, use Apple. And it's probably because it's just well-designed stuff. It, it, at least to me, it never breaks touch ID, face ID. All this just works reliably, and I love it. Still, there are people in the world who you know, like to draw attention to this, <laughs> right? Um, and that, this is tech Twitter. Like, React's great, but hey, use effect sucks. And, and like, we, we'll pick things where the thing doesn't quite connect, and, and that's what we focus on. So the things I'm about to talk about where React does indeed fall short are things like this. They are drops in an otherwise fantastical ocean, OK? Um, so with that. How does React suck? Number one, and this is based on a lot of data from crawling Twitter and also from consulting with various people who have various foot guns that they experience with React. Number one is performance. React is not the fastest way to build UI on the web today. Um, in not in terms of developer speed, but in terms of runtime performance, like things that your, your users download. Um, that's mainly due to the fact that React DOM as a dependency is pretty large, um, even compressed, and, it's, and some would say it's unnecessary. Uh, proponents of Svelte, solid, quick, will be like, you don't even need a virtual DOM. 
And maybe they're right, because those ship without virtual DOMs, quick, solid, and svelte. Um, and they create applications just fine. Not only that, not only the bundle size from React DOM, but also the way React does updates. Um, it, some would say is not as performant as it could be. By some, I mean people who, pr who are proponents of signals um, or solid JS, where it's, it's a fundamental difference in how updates work, um, where in React, when a state change happens, every component under that state change will re-render, will effectively, the function will be called again, whether or not they're different. Whereas in solid, only the values of signals change. Uh, so components don't, quote unquote, unnecessarily re-render. Number two, um, people complain about cognitive load. And that is in React, because of this update mechanism, you need to strategically use and think about when you use functions like react.memo, when you import them, how to use them. And react.memo also takes a second argument, which is a kind of like a dependency array. If anything, if anything changes here, re-render the component, et cetera. This, this kind of deviates from, I just want to write components and forget about it and then they're on screen, right? So we're coming back to, okay, I still need to be mindful more than I maybe want to be. And then third is React is moving a lot to the server. Um, I don't necessarily think this is, I don't think any of these are actually fundamentally bad problems. These are just things people complain about, and I'm just a messenger here. But people talk about this new focus on server components and framework first. Um, I fully understand the reason for this, and I want to share that with you as well, is because when you move to things like server components, you have to start at the server and then add client stuff incrementally. You cannot start from a client app and then add server pieces because that's not how it works. Everything comes from a server, whether it's static sites or dynamic sites, okay? Um, in fact, this is the prevalent advice from the React core team. If you use React, you should be using a React framework. If your existing app doesn't use a framework, you should incrementally migrate to one. And if you're creating a new React project, you should use a framework from the beginning. Uh, the reason for this is because data fetching and rendering happens server first and then can be streamed to the client, but the reverse is just not possible. Um, so these are the things that people complain about a lot. And I'd like to illustrate them in the form of just some small demos here. So I'm using Arc, which in my opinion is the best browser in the world. Um, yes, thank you for that. Um, I love it. If you don't have Arc, you should. If you need an invite code, come see me after the talk. So what we have here side by side, on the left is React, on the right is Solid. And they are identical applications. They're just counters with 10,000 random numbers, okay? Um, if we look at the code, let's go look at the code. Uh, sure, I'll save you. Um, let's go look at the code here. And what we'll do is open up the React example, which is a Next.js app, just because Next.js I actually love. Um, and we'll open up the solid example, which is a solid start application here. And we'll kind of open them side by side so we get a feel. So if you look at the code, they're kind of the same, right? Um, you have a component which array from length 10,000 renders a lie with Matt Ryan. This is the same, this is actually 100% identical between React and Solid. Number two, you have a function component home, and it's almost the same between React and Solid, the left being React, the right being Solid, except for where React uses use state, Solid uses create signal. And where React addresses count as count, Solid reads count, counter, rather, with a function. Okay? But besides these, they are the same code. The fundamental difference is how these libraries do updates. So if we look at them running in the browser, I will increment this counter here. And what we see is all of these 10,000 elements are recalculated every time. Whereas with solid, that's not true. And it's a, it's a fundamental way in how signals work over state in React, where when I call this function, I am implicitly subscribing home to this observable reactive value. This, is, this, this doesn't just read it, but also subscribes home to it. And when I counter, it notifies the subscribers. So literally only this changes, right? And that is one way Solid has a leg up on React. But there's work being done in React to remedy this. There's um, something called, Re this is a great YouTube video I can highly recommend. Um, I'll, I don't know how you, uh, just Google it, I guess. But um, they talk about a new compiler that will add react.memo strategically in the right places for you. And that's coming soon at some point, I believe. But if we wanted to make React work like solid, we literally just wrap this component in memo. And as long as its props and state don't change, we have the same fine-grained reactivity, literally with one function call. So I'm gonna come back here, reload this. There will be a server client handoff error that's to be expected because it's random. Um, this is fine, we want this. And now we should have the fine-grained reactivity as we do in solid, right? It's just using memo strategically. But that is the source of friction we talked about. Um, finally, 
people complain about the server dependencies. And the reason for that, just to, while there is no solution at the moment, because server components are very, I don't want to save you, server components are very still experimental, this is kind of why that exists. So let's say we have a counter app um, with, you know, so we have H1, we have under the H1, kind of like we just created, we have a count, count uh, zero, and we have an increment button, right? If all of these are server components, first of all, they cannot be, because increment has an on-click handler. And you, you cannot click on server things. Servers are not interactive. So this needs to be a client component. So now we have a, two server components and a client component. And there needs to be some intelligent way to differentiate the two. And this will have to have a use client directive. So what you need to make server components work is a next generation bundler that can understand where to split client bundles and where to split server bundles, and a next generation router, so that when you navigate to a route, it pulls down the server stuff, renders it, and then in includes the client pieces where it should. That doesn't exist, and that's the source of friction, but there's work being done in you know, Parcel and other bundlers to accommodate for this, and it's coming, it just takes time. Still, server components is too early, and the prevalent advice is don't use it outside of Next.js for a reason, okay? But fundamentally, what I wanna share with you is React is and has been a tool primarily focused on developer health through declarative abstraction. Um, these ways that it falls short, sure, but there's work being done to remedy it as I've shared, and I think that is the trajectory it will take, or at least I hope so. This has enabled us to build immensely ambitious applications, right? I think of Notion. We wouldn't have Notion today without React. We wouldn't have, um, well, Figma doesn't use React, but we wouldn't have similar, we wouldn't have Code Sandbox we just heard from even without React. It's been monumental in doing this. And the reason it's been monumental in doing this is, it, is because it allows us to build with economies of scale. What that means is the cost of production for web applications diminishes over time through advancements at the UI library layer, but also at the framework layer, et cetera. There is a point, though, where this stuff breaks down, where we get diseconomies of scale. Um, can any of you think of where things, despite having these tools, start to break down. It's when the teams grow. Um, a lot of people, myself included, have fallen into the trap of thinking, if I hire more engineers, we'll ship faster. <laughs> and that is, yeah, I see you shaking your head over. That, that is not always true. If you hire more engineers, there's a high chance you're gonna need more retrospectives and processes, and de debugging gets hard. Um, productivity is kind of this next frontier that is ripe for developer health tools. Um, if we consider some developer health-focused tools that help productivity, I can think of a number of them, from Code Sandbox that we just saw, to PartyKit, to Flight Control, to Crab Nebula, to even Stripe. Like, payments before Stripe were hard. And Stripe is a developer health. All of these help with developer health. And in the spirit of appreciating tools and giving you practical takeaways, I know many of, I know probably all of you use GitHub every day, so I'm not gonna talk about GitHub, but I wanted to highlight one that I've been using that I think is phenomenal. For, how many of you have heard of or use this? Yeah, that's exactly why I wanna share this tool with you today, because I do think it will be valuable, um, especially in terms of debugging. Um, and I have like five minutes. I wanna show you how this actually has added value to me and some teams I work with, and then wrap up. So um, there's a hypothetical e-commerce store where you can buy one of these things. You can choose, I want it green or blue. And you, you click on Add to Cart. Um, and at some point, it just fails, right? And you don't know why. So you reproduce this bug, and using Replay, you, what you get is a HTTP link um, that kind of looks like a video, but it doesn't. So this is kind of what you'll get. And I hope the internet cooperates. If it doesn't, we're gonna have trouble. But whatever, it doesn't really matter. So this is what, if I send this link to someone, what you'll see is something that looks like a video, but is, is, is a little bit more. And so, okay, yeah, it looks like a video. D does it play, though? And I must say, the internet, let me, maybe I should tether, because I, I've played with the Wi-Fi a lot and it just doesn't work. But I wanted to show you this because it helps time travel debug. Wow. Come on, there we go, okay. So this is what, it, it looks like a failing Cypress test. It also works with Cypress on CI. So what you can do is you can time travel through this thing that looks like a video and find where it fails. And I wanted to show you that you can see each time a click event happens and jump to where it happens. And you can even go to the code that triggers the event. Where here you can like add a console.log, chose a color, event.target.value, um, after the fact, and 
and jump to like when you chose the color. It's absolutely nuts. This is literal time travel right here. Um, it, it's a React app where you can like inspect element. Look at this. It's unbelievable. Um, in here, and I can like click on some. Who's talking over there? Hey, pay attention. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to blow minds here. I'd appreciate some, some respect. Anyway, so um, what I can see is purchase. <laughs> what I can see is purchase form. You can look at the props and state of these. Um, there's a timeout apparently at suspense. But this is like real time debugging where this thing is, is nuts because it captures literally the entire event loop and replays it for you. Even the network tab where there's some like request failing here. And I can look at the request and the response and all of this and fully diagnose and fix bugs as they happen. And I think this is phenomenal because it's still serving this purpose of developer help. I was terribly afraid when I got like emails saying, hey, this is broken. And then I ask for a reproduction. Um, and then they send me steps, repro steps, and a GitHub issue. And then what do I have to do as a maintainer? Uh, I have to git clone, first of all, or git pull some branch. And then I have to npm install. I have to do all this stuff. I have to switch contexts. My mind isn't built for this. Our minds are not built for context switching. If you've tried to switch like four contexts in a day, you'll probably agree. I see many of your heads nodding. And so Replay has been really valuable, and I wanted to share that with you to kind of complete this cornucopia of other developer health-focused tools. And that's, here's a list of um, them for those you haven't or maybe have heard of, just to give you some, some direction. But I do think this is the next evolution of developer health tools, okay? With that, I want to invite you to think of this question as we wrap up, which is paying it forward. Um, the world wasn't ready for React when it came out because people said it was a bunch of nonsense. What? You're including HTML and JavaScript? What? That's weird. What? Rethinking best practices. I'm sure many of you were around at the time. Um, but it has kind of won and is winning. And so I want to invite you in the context of developer health tools. What are you going to build to help this? What problem do you keep having that you can solve for yourself and then package up into a little NPM dependency, um, ideally wrapped with tests as well, and, and, and ship it so that the rest of us and you and your team and the world, the tech ecosystem, can benefit? Um, in keeping with this theme of developer health, frameworks, React, et cetera, um, there's similar talks happening at the conference tomorrow that touch on these topics. Um, that if, if, if this was interesting to you, I think those will be as well. Um, this is not to take away from the other talks. These are just kind of related. And so if you wanted to check those out, I'd recommend. And with that, Render ATL 2023, I want to thank you so much for making the time and attention.